And there is not a single country in the world which can teach us democracy which we fought for because we wanted it. If you have denied democracy, you have to do the democracy. They knew about it. They knew we had this program of land acquisition and land reform. successfully filed their nomination papers by the close of nomination court for the presidential post. As we head to August 23, where the nation decides, hashtag Zimbabwe decides August 2023. Here on this, the free talk, we talk to all here on this the free talk in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation, we bring you the issues that matter. We talk to the candidates that have successfully filed their nomination and we bring them we bring to you their policy, their vision, and what they hope to achieve if elected into office. We allow you to scrutinize the candidates before they are in office. Join me after this break on this the free talk as one of the presidential candidates talks to me. Now, welcome back to this, the free talk in part partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation for Freedom. I am your host as usual, Dara B. And we are talking elections, people, power and Zimbabwe's future. Now joining me in studio this evening is a presidential candidate who is representing the National People's Congress, an engineer by training, 
she is vying for presidents. Wilbert Bayo. Thank you very much for joining me. Samaita. Thank you, blessed. <laughs> Beautiful. Nice to see you again. Amazing. Yes. Now, now let's just, just by way of introduction to just introduce yourself so that the people understand the person who wants to run Zimbabwe. Well, my name is Engineer Wilbert Archibald Mbaiwa. A, a former soldier, briefly, never ro rose to a very high level. An engineer and a banker, both by, by training and experience. I'm a person who started business at a very early age, well before I went to university, and continued to run my own businesses, primarily consulting, engineering, project management, and so forth. But I, I also do a lot of property development. I did it primarily for the, t for the time when I get old. You don't want to be relying on your children and other people to look after you. So at first, that was, that was it. I never meant to be in politics, and it's not something that I really wanted to do. It came as a surprise to me six years ago. Mm. Yeah, let's talk about six years ago. Six years ago, you were uh, the driving force, or you were helping uh, Joyce Mjuru uh, to ascend to presidency. Let's talk about that. I thought I was helping her. Yeah? I just joined in as a very ordinary member because I had been unhappy about how she had been chucked out of government. I didn't think it was proper. I thought a due process must always take place when someone is accused. Is Until you know someone is guilty, you cannot take a step like the, the former president did, whom I admire very much, by the way. So I went in from a sympathy point of view and worked with her for more than one and a half years. It was a good period. It was a learning period. I did help here, not to the extent that people think. All I did was to provide vehicles when air vehicles were not available. And at that time, I was naive, I think. I thought everyone who goes into politics is committed, is honesty. So I thought what I was doing was what everyone else was doing, playing their, their part until I discovered a lot of people come in for different reasons. What are these different reasons that people come into politics for? Just like I discovered when we started the National People's Congress. That's what I discovered during the, my time with my Mjuru. Most people think there is a lot of money in politics. So some people come pocket hunting. They don't come because they've got a leadership to offer. Someone is looking for something. Like, for example, out of the more than 2,000 people that I spoke to, trying to find out if they are leaders in themselves, three quarters within the first week asked for some assistance in their businesses, to start a business, for school fees, and so forth. So I told myself we didn't have leaders. But I've always known that for any country, it's very difficult to have like for Zimbabwe, I would hazard to say, it's difficult to have more than six, seven people who can effectively run this country at any given point in the life of a nation. And I think it's the same with America, it's the same with any other country in the world. Leaders are very hard to come by. This I've always known from my experience in, 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 in working for private companies. I, I did work for ITC as a CEO of Sunway City. I did become the vice chairman of ZESA at some point, a very early age. I worked for the Infrastructure Development Bank of Zimbabwe. I had, I had matured. I could see leadership was very scarce. For example, in IDC, which is where I met one man who probably changed my life, Mike Nduzo. He's the only man that I can say contributed to my leadership, both in terms of style, maybe in terms of capacity as well. And in terms of the wisdom that, that we shared. But I have seen everywhere that I have gone that leadership is very scarce. Good leaders are very scarce. And you think you can fill that gap? Why? I have never failed 
in almost everything that I've done in my life. I was fairly successful at the bank. Uh, that's when we did a lot of the infrastructure projects during the GNU. I was leading that process. I was fairly successful at Zesa, although we had challenges because I didn't like the structure that existed then. So I had an argument with, with the then president, Robert Gabriel Mkab. I was saying we don't need an executive chairman for a corporate as big as Zesa. Any, any, any large organization does not need an executive chairman. You are killing it. You can't have a person who is a CEO during the large part of, of the month, and when you go for a board meeting, he's also the chairman and CEO. How does he scrutinize himself? That was my argument with the president then. But I learned a lot. Uh, I, I, I was also chairman of a CF, CFI Langford Estates for, for a while. And I, th I think I did fairly well. I've done fairly well in my personal life, coming from a very humble background. A very poor background, so let me say. But I must be grateful to, to the country, a, particularly the coming of independence. Because my life changed, I went to school, I was able to start a business. I got a lot from the army. In fact, I think most of the wisdom that I, I think I already had was developed during my short period in the army, which I think is a place where almost everyone must pass through at some point in order to understand how a nation functions. But the army, as it is known, is a place where there's rigidity, isn't it? Where people take instructions without thinking. Is this why, what people should learn? No, it's, the army is not like that. I've always told people, there's a lot of flexibility in the army. In fact, in, within the army, what, what my experience was, you never get an instruction on something that you have not proposed yourself. Like my experience, if we are going to have a project, let's say we are building a new, a new camp, you are asked to put forward a proposal. You go through it yourself. You present it to the authorities. They go through it. They quiz it. Then it comes back as an instruction. So it's not rigid. You implement your own ideas. Unless, obviously, when you are in the middle of a war, anyone else can give you an instruction, not just a commander. Anyone who thinks you are in danger can tell you where to go. But generally, instructions from a commander in the army never start with the commander. They start with the person who is receiving them, putting them in as a proposal. That was my experience. I always put forward the proposals, they scrutinize them, then they came back as instructions. Can you go ahead and do this? So there's a lot of learning that goes in there. Most people think it's, it's, it's about instructions. No, it's, it's about command. No. Most of it is, is very strategic work that goes in there. But my experience is that it starts with the executor. He pro just like you do when you want a, a project funded by the bank. It comes from you to the bank. The bank looks at it. They come back to you. They tell you where to change. Or it's okay. And then you get the money. That's the process. That go Those are... And I, I was lucky. I worked with probably with some of the most intelligent people at that time in the army. And I understood why they were intelligent. Because remember, these are people who are the cream in the country. Because they were in high school. And to go to high school at the time was very difficult. So the people who went to war were very intelligent. They were the cream of, of, of our students in this country. And that fact must be understood. That's why even today you find a lot of intelligent people in the army. These are the people who are running the country, aren't they? Because we've got retired uh, army, army general, uh, Constantino Chuenga is vice president. We have, had, we have a lot of retired members of the military who are serving as permanent secretaries. Yet you want to remove them from office. Why? When you say they're intelligent. I don't want to remove them from, from office. And no one would ever remove them. They have a right to work anyway. When you retire from the army, it's your right to, to choose a place where you must go and work. But if you become president, mm -hmm. would you still keep uh, General Chuenga as your vice? You would have removed him from office, wouldn't you? We are not in the same party. But if he was, I probably would. It depends 
on what I think he can, he can offer and what he thinks he can offer. All I am saying is, you don't get into office to remove anyone. Go into office to change things. When I do my work, whether I'm doing it at a personal level, at a company level, at a national level, I don't look at, at the challenges that, that are there. I don't look at the problems that have been created. I look at what the country must do in order to move forward, including correcting those problems. I never look at the issues of this one stole money and so forth. That's very important. That's for the police and the system to, to sort out. I focus on what we should do as a nation in order to move forward. At any given point, when you have a quarrel with someone, don't focus on the quarrel. Focus on the future. What, what is it that you want to change this government? Because the government that you are challenging, you want to do a regime change on, is that led by Emerson Dambuzo Mnangagwa. Why do you want him out of office? You can, I am challenging the government, but I'm not challenging the government. I'm challenging myself to achieve what I think I can do for this country. Things that I know I can do better. Never challenge anyone for anything. Challenge yourself. The person you must challenge at any given point in your life is yourself. I think I, I know why we are where we are. Why are we where we are? Personally, I think it's what was not done. A lot of things have been done. People look at the foreign currency. People look managing our industry and so forth. But we are managing the same industry that was left by Smith. We are cooking in the same pot that was left by Smith. We have not planned this country. That's the only thing that I think can change this country. I'll give an example. When I came into Harare, I was going to university. I, have, I saw Willowville Industries, I saw Workington, I saw Granite Side, I saw Bluffield. And I have not seen anything new. We are using the same space, and I've said this before, that existed pre-1980. If you get married today, you, you, you use a small pot. But as the family grows, your pot must grow. Our pot has remained the same since 1980. Whose fault is that? Is the fault of, of I think Mugabe, if I have to, to talk about the failure of Mugabe, I think that is the only failure that I think is, is very critical. He did not plan this country. Yes, he focused on education. He focused on other things. No one for, forgot that he, we've got an increasing population, an increasing population of entrepreneurs who need somewhere to produce. Who, and we've got a population that needs to consume, that needs to eat something. And we continue to cook from the same pot. That must change. We created growth points in the early 80s. And that was a very good idea. But they have never grown because we didn't plan for their growth. A lot of uh, settlements have come up. Some formally and informally. But I think they were never planned. When I say they were never planned. Okay, so, so whose fault is that of things that you mentioned? Who owns the play? The people that were in power at the time, the people that are in power now. But I believe even the private sector shares a blame. I believe the technocrats in government are to blame. But most importantly, the leader is always to blame. There is a champion in, in every scenario where you are trying to move forward. Someone must lead the process. And I think the critical ideas must come from the president. They must come from the chairman of the company. They must come from the father. He must give direction. And the technocrats must be able to say, we are moving this way. But I blame the technocrats because, for example, I'll give you an example of Harare. You've got a, a director of physical planning. You've got a director in, in the Minister of Local Government. And their role right now is to simply look at subdivisions and so forth. In other words, we are looking at the same space that was left by Smith and we are subdividing it into smaller. That's not planning the country. Planning the country is saying, where is our new area of production? Where are our new industry is going to be? Where is a manufacturing plant for cars going to be? This is in 50 years' time. In other words, as we sit here, 
we must be able to go to the Ministry of Local Government and see a plan for Harare over the next for the next 50 years for Blawayo, for Mburwe, for Gutu, for every growth point. We must have that plan, but we don't. Which means we never planned it. Either it must come from the president, which it must, or it can come from the advisors to say, no, we think Harare is, be is becoming crowded. We need to expand it in this direction. We need to do this. But in terms of the capacity of the country to produce, it must come from the president. But, but uh, our government, led by President Emerson Dambuzomnangagwa, is talking about growing the mining sector to a $12 billion economy. Um, we have grown our wheat uh, to become self-sufficient. We have also uh, brought in this Fumbuza Itwasa program. Is this not the things that you're supposed to be supporting instead of wanting to be president? I support them, but we've always done these things. We've had Fumbuza is not a new word. We've always had Fumbuza all, all our lives. We've had wheat, we've produced wheat before. But what I'm saying is, where is the, where, where, where is the employment? Where government, you, government says that it has created 3.9 million jobs over the past five years in construction, in industry. Do you dispute this? I am in construction. I'm, I'm an engineer. These are jobs for a week, for two weeks, and so forth. Where are they? If, because can you put three million jobs on Bite Bridge, Chirundu Road? Where, where are these jobs? Where is the construction when you drive around? So, and when you, you have got three million jobs, it, it should be evident everywhere. You can't have so many people in, in the informal sector when you create so many jobs. So, I think let's separate between uh, election rhetoric and uh, what is on the ground. The collapse of our economy is not in doubt. Look at what happens in, to our currency. It's because we are f focusing on, on managing, you see, the parameters. We are focusing on, on managing inflation, on managing uh, the exchange rate, and so forth. These are things in a, in, a, in a good economy that manage themselves. That's why you leave them to manage themselves. When you are producing, you don't have to worry about the exchange rate. When you can export enough, when you've got enough to consume within your own country, you don't have to talk about these figures every day. People see them in their pockets. People see these things. So when you start talking about these things, because these are indicators which we are talking about, but what are you measuring? How many people are in the economy? Because for, I know, for example, the people in Guru, the people in Good, are not part of these statistics. Because who is counting how many people are, are dying of hunger out there? So these statistics don't mean anything because you are measuring the same so small space that was left by Smith. So obviously you will get good figures because you are measuring what you are producing in your house. But you are not measuring how the entire country is faring. But we can see it. When you go to the farms, look at the roads. When you go, when you drive around Harare, look at the roads. So what are these indicators measuring? So let us not be theoretical. I have never been theoretical in my life. I want to see the product in my hands. Whatever you're talking about, let me see it. But what, I, what I'm coming to do is to change the trajectory of development and politics in the country. Because I was tired of this politics of shouting at each other. That's all we hear during elections. We never have to listen about a program of development. What is it that you're going to do to change this country? Yes, you might say Mnangagwa has done this bad, or so and so has done this bad. But we want to, I personally want to know what is it that you're going to do what differently. Is, what is it that you're going to do differently? Um, same by you. I have said we are cooking from the same pot that was left by Smith. So whatever we produce out of there is never going to, to be enough. For a start, let's look at what happens. Everyone comes to Harare to buy what they must sell in Guruwe, in Gutu, in Msarabani, in Wange. When, you, when I drove to Wange, when I drove to, to Manjolo, I was surprised to see lobels being sold at Manjolo. And I said... 
Where is Nobel's produced? They said it comes from Harare. And I said, my God, how would you drive 1,070 kilometers to deliver bread? Why can't we make bread at Manjoro? Why can't we make bread at Murewa? That's, that's the starting point. So your, your bread is costing a dollar because everyone is covering for the cost of transport, of delivering this bread all over the country. That's, in other words, why are we not producing at every center in this country? We used to produce bread. Everyone was a producer of bread. You used to produce a bre bread in your house. I used to produce bread in our own house. We used to make bread in every house. Every household was, was a factory. I, I think you know what I'm talking about. Beer was in every house. You would move from house to house to look for beer. So why can't we do it not in every household this time, but at every growth point in every town? Why does it have to be Harare that produces beer to distribute all over the country? In other words, we are creating a country of consumers. And because our own capacity to produce has not grown, we are having to import. And when you import, you are simply taking your money outside. So our problems will never go away until that scenario is changed. This country must produce what it is and export the rest. Guruve must produce what it is. It must manufacture what it is and export the rest to Harare. Murewa must do the same thing. Chipinge must do the same thing. The small towns must export to Harare. Not Harare exporting to every other small town. It doesn't make sense. That's our prices will never go down. Don't expect prices to go down until you increase production, until you make sure that every growth point produces something. So we think the starting point is we need to plant the country so that every growth point produces something that it is. Why should we take maize from Guruwe to Harare? Grind it and take the millimil back to Guruwe where the maize come from. I, think, I don't think it makes sense. Is that not the African philosophy where we, we, um, we, we are taking raw materials from our, from, from our country to, to the west, to the east, and then buy it back? It's not the African philosophy. The African philosophy is what I want to bring. Because the African philosophy, when you look at the... You know, you were a sub-chief to me and I was a sub-chief to him. You produced something and kept enough for yourself. But you gave me something to keep in case there was a hunger somewhere in the country. And I also did the same thing. Zundira Mambo. That's the philosophy that I'm talking about. There must be a Zunde at every growth point. Then they export the excess that they don't need. That's the African philosophy. This new philosophy is not African. It's something imposed on us or imposed by poverty. Because when you are poor, you can do anything. That's why we used to go and live with our potential father-in-laws because we were poor and we had to work for our wives. This is because of poverty. But I think it's also, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about just the poverty of the material things. Maybe it's also intellectual. Maybe it's also in terms of wisdom. I think we are lacking wisdom. We are relying so much on what we get from books. That we did in the right. Books that were written by someone else in Germany, in England. And we think those things can apply here automatically. I think that's where we are making a mistake. You are an engineer. Yes. Graded on books that were written from somewhere in England. And yet you are telling me that we should not look at that. I will tell you the question that I asked when I went to the University of Zimbabwe. I was lucky. I had done engineering in the army for, for 20 months. For 21 months. So when I went to the university and he sat in a classroom, I asked uh, someone, unless he, and unfortunately he's late now, a former friend, and I said, is this what they are calling engineering? I felt it was more engineering science than engineering because I had done actual engineering in the army. Very practical. So there's also something wrong with our education and we can have time to talk about that at that time. It's actually the starting point. Whether it is psychology that you are studying, whether it's engineering, it has nothing to do with you. Engineering, yes, is universal, but psychology is not. You start psychology at the university and you come and tell me about it. Is it your psychology? We need to develop this country based on a certain psychology which is predominantly African. 
let's say people in this country elect you to be their president. The economy, let's talk about the currency. What is your plan with the currency? What do you think is the solution to the currency? The solution to the currency is production. Is what I'm talking about. When you produce enough for your own consumption, when you go to Guru and say, let's have a brewery here. When you go to Nyanga and say, let's have a, a honey producing plant. When you go to Matebele land and say, you've got so many animals, so, many, so much cattle. Let's have a leather factory here. When you go to Gokwe and say, we produce most of the cotton. Let's do a lot of weaving. Let's produce our, our own clothes here. When you go to any other place. This is what Smith did. Yes, maybe we, we destroyed it, didn't we? We, we, we didn't destroy it. David we we White, used it. D David Whited is destroyed right now. Mm -hmm. We used to cover the cotton weaving that you talk about in Kadoma. Yes. In Blawayo, we used to have Marilyn clothing. Yes. Manufacturing of garments. We used to have Kango store. We used to have an amazing industry in Blawayo, Tutu Siakun. But that has all gone, hasn't it? It was amazing, but it was, it was not adequate. That's where I'm coming from. That's where I'm, I'm saying we need to go back to the basics to start producing. It's just like in your own home. If you don't grow tomatoes, it means you are buying from your neighbor. So you become poorer as he increases his prices. So your own currency, assuming your own individual currency in your home, will obviously collapse. That's what is happening to us. Yes, let, I'm not trying to praise Smith, but he did what was enough for the 300,000 whites that existed in this country in 1980. That's why I'm saying we have not invested in anything. Our entrepreneurs are there waiting to find somewhere to work. But we have not planned for it. We don't have a new industrial area in Harare. Not even a single one. We don't have a new industrial area in Mutare. Not even a single one. I'm saying that's where the challenge is. Let us talk to a civil servant who is sitting and working for government right now. Mm -hmm. And they are looking at you and say, what do I get from you if I make you president? You see, civil servants, when you look at Smith's time, I'm not trying to praise what Smith did. But you see, when you are growing up and you are living in your own home and so forth, you must be able to understand yourself and say, what are my limitations? The limitations of government are in cash, in terms of cash. But they are not limited in terms of resources. When you look back, if you joined council, after a few years you were entitled to a piece of land. Maybe you pay something. When you joined the government, you were entitled, because that's the benefit that your employer can give you. But the government is not doing that. They are giving land to a land baron, who then sells it to a civil servant. I am saying no. Land is a state resource. The starting point is when you have accommodation, 40% of your problems are solved. And I think you know this from your experience in Harare. So that's one thing that we can quickly give to our civil servants. We can promise them on the day they join that after three years, after so many years, after such a period, you are entitled to this. So that you don't expect them to use their meager salary to pay for land. To pay in a land baron for land. So that's the starting point. The second point is, when we start producing, like I have, I have said, it means a, our economy is growing. And when the economy grows, what you earn is value, no matter how small it is. When I joined the army, my salary was $198. That was at the university at the time. It was very difficult to finish. It was a lot of money. So, we, it's not the quantum that you get, it's the value that you get. My promise to the civil servants uh, is that their lives have got to change. What we offer them outside a salary, especially in the initial phase, is very critical. You don't want them to start struggling for land when it belongs to government. So that they can be assured. I don't want a civil servant who goes out there, talks to a land baron or a developer, it puts up a deposit, loses their money in the process because the land was not developed. No. That I will change. And that doesn't take time. 
And but we are looking at more people that require public service. We are looking at people in the rural areas who spend their entire life farming. When they get to 65, 70 years, they are unable to do the same work. And they die there. No, we must also look at those people. Because they have contributed to this economy. Let's talk about a student who is in school right now and has, has no prospect of getting a job. Most of our fellow citizens are at Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Training to go to England. What I have talked about uh, making sure we produce at every growth point is very critical. How long would that take you? In order to build uh, a factory shell, let's say 600 of them, maybe the cost is about 300 million to 400 million. That can take a year. You build 600 of them. Because remember, these are factory shells. You go to good to put four of them. I'm putting this as an example. Go to Groove and do the same thing. Come to Harare, put that, create a new area of production. Why am I saying it's possible? Because we've got entrepreneurs who have got their money, either from mining or wherever. They don't know where to put it. They end up buying wonderful cars. And you think Zimbabweans are unreasonable. No. He has nowhere to put that money. But if we create that opportunity somewhere in Mutare to say, if you want to produce clothes, and you've got your money. Here is a starting point. Because the starting point is a working space. We have not planned for it. It's not there. Let's plan for it immediately. That shouldn't take time. And someone has got somewhere where they can go and produce. The entrepreneurs for me are already there. But the opportunities do not exist because we have not planned for it. There is no area in, in Arare, a new area. People are going into infields. This is something you, you don't have to read any magazine or for you to see. You drive around, people are producing on the verandas of their homes. As I've said before, these are big business people, as far as I'm concerned, who are looking for a space to operate from. So that's the starting point. Everything rests on us uh, creating opportunities for our people. And do you think this government is not doing that? They are not. Well, tell me the new industrial area for Harare. Tell me the new industrial area for Gruwe. But if you ask me, you, I can show you a lot of residential areas that have been developed. Where do you think those people are going to get work from? You are creating new areas of, of residence. And people are moving into town because their brother has a new house and so forth. But there is no work because there is no corresponding increase in the areas of production. Where you are going to put your industries, where you are going to manufacture, and so forth. It's something that they can do. But I think they didn't think about it. I don't think anyone thought about it. I have never heard anyone talk about it. I mean, you've worked uh, at the highest level um, around this government, vice chairperson of ZESA, mm -hmm. interacting with the president. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you sell these ideas? IDBZ. You had the money to plant into factory shells. You no, there was it in the, your pocket. There was no money at the time. Most of the money went into infrastructure. But I did share a lot of some of these ideas. I'll give you an example. When I came back from Australia in 1995, I was this vibrant young man who had started public-private partnerships. And I was selling them around to various ministries. But I'm glad the one man at CARS, Kariko Gagasek took that idea. That's how Kasef ended up putting that. But we were, it was through a company that I was running at the time. It was very difficult for people to accept an idea of public-private partnerships. But now everyone is talking about it. But we are unable to bring them to fruition. Maybe either because we don't understand them, or maybe our terms are not that, that good. But I know it's also because of lack of understanding. I know it's because people look for something. Why are we not using that? In fact, I am saying, in terms of infrastructure, I don't think a government should be using its own money to do a huge project like the Bide Bridge Chirundu Road, Bide Bridge Harare. Because you take away all the money 
that we have for infrastructure and put it into one project. Those projects, that's where you must invite private investors. Encourage them. Make it easy for them to come in and invest. So that the little that you get from, from your taxes and so forth, you put it in, in your farm roads, in your rural roads, and so forth. But we are putting the bulk of our money. I, I heard the, a, one of the guys in the ministry saying, we're using our own money to build this road. Yes, of course, but it's wrong. Because all your money is now tied up in one project. And the rest of the country is, uh, uh, cannot develop because of that. I am saying let's, look, let's use our little resources to develop our, our, our small towns, our farms, and, and so forth. And let's invite private investors to invest in these major projects. And let's sit down and say, what is it that we can do to make sure they come in? In any case, that's the only way we can get a, the much needed foreign direct investment through infrastructure. Allow them to make their own money through tolls or whatever process. Let them make their own money. We are happy to have our infrastructure. We are happy to have our people working. We are happy to have, happy to have industry grow. Because I worry, even as I talk about the need for industrial expansion across the country, I worry about energy, for example. If I create so many, where is the energy going to come from? So there are many areas where, that we need to look at so that there is a balance. In my manifesto, I have looked at the hydro, I have looked at the coal-based energy, I have looked at solar, and say, if we are going to, to go to Gutu and build a big factory there, where is the energy going to come from? What is your fascination with Gutu and Guru? You see, I'm just talking about outlying areas. I could say Mahenya, I could say Chidodo, I could say Binga. I'm actually fascinated by Binga more than most of the places. Because when we went there, I said, we said to ourselves, why can't we put a car manufacturing plant in a binga as a way to make sure that development comes to binga? Let's put a big project there. Let's encourage private investors to go there and put something. I am fascinated by cars. My fascination with car production came when, at a point when we heard that Toyota wanted to come here to produce. And for some reason, it ended up in South Africa. That's the same time when Multi Choice wanted to set up here before they set up in South Africa. And they ended up in South Africa. I said, why can't we produce cars? So when I went to Benga, I said, this is the ideal place for cars. I said, because if we've got a huge manufacturing plant in Benga, it means we have no choice but to build a very nice road all the way from Benga to Harare, to Blawayo, to every other place. So we can initiate development through development in Binga. And I have said all huge industries for me, we must encourage them to go outside. So cars, I know we can because we had wheel level, I know we were assembling, but it was a good beginning for producing our own, our own, our own car. I think every nation must have something that it says it, it produces from its own initiatives, from its own. We must have that. And I thought cars for, for Zimbabwe were very good. I thought because of our location, remember we are at the center of Sadak. I've always said if you draw a, a, a circle from Deben, half of you is in the sea. But if you come to Harare and carefully draw your circle, you'll touch every capital city in Sadak. So I've always seen Zimbabwe as being a privileged country in terms of location, so that we can produce, we can distribute, we can do anything from here. We've got ad natural advantages. Of course, we don't have the sea, we don't have ports, but our location gives us these advantages. So I've always said we need to produce. And that's my fascination for producing at every corner of the country, so that those uh, in Mount Darwin can quickly export to Mozambique, those in Tari to Mozambique, those in Bide Bridge, Blawayo to South Africa, those, and, and those elsewhere to, out, to anywhere outside of the country. Look, looking at, uh, uh, at your manifesto, uh, mm -hmm. President Nia Rupert Ashworth, by you, you say that your ideology mm -hmm. 
is Ubuntu, yes. primarily, preliminarily expanded in, in your manifesto to say development without boundaries. Yes. Um, this development which leaves no one behind. Yes. Ubuntu, for me, the concept uh, comes from our practice of Nimbe. Nimbe is where you help people in your community who don't have the resources, say, during, during the, the, the planting season. And when everyone else is done, everyone else will take their resources to that one person so that he also grows his own crops, his or her own crops. That's Nimbe. In other words, the village is saying, even though he doesn't have the resources to plant his, his or her maize, we can use the community resources so that when we then reap, she or he is also reaping. That's Nimbe. In other words, the village is saying, none of us must be left behind. And this is an African concept. The same concept that ZANPF is using, is it? No one, no place will be left behind. They are using the, the phrase, but not the practice. There is a difference between the theory and the implementation. If you are saying no one must be left behind, and yet there is no plan for Gruwe, there is no plan for Binga, there is no plan for Kai, how do they come? When you have got people in the mining areas, like the 12 billion that you talked about, it has nothing to do with this country, that money, because you are mining your own resources, and we don't know where they are. If you go to buy to, 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 to buy the bridge, I think you see your chrome going out. So it's not your 12 billion. It has nothing to do with you. Yours is the cost of repairing your roads, of filling up the dams. That's what is yours. Yours is the work that is left by these people who are taking our minerals outside. So the 12 billion has nothing to do with you and me. So I don't worry about those. Those are figures that have no meaning. Literally. I was saying the 12 billion has nothing to do with you and me. Because you know very well who is mining and where our minerals are going. That should not happen. So in our framework for mining and or, or, or management of these resources, we are saying we need to know where they are going. We need to start here. If we are going to process, the processing must start here. And Mugabe used to talk about this a lot. We must process locally at least up to, a, up to a certain point. We can't be taking raw materials outside as if we have no industry uh, to, uh, to look after. So I don't want to talk about the 12 billion because it belongs to someone else. I, I want us to, to zero in on this Ubuntu um, issue that you speak about. Mm -hmm. Now, how is that possible in Zimbabwe where we are so polarized? Where we beat each other up for political power. Where we insult each other for different ideologies and different thinking. That's why I said I need to change the trajectory. I think we can do it, the trajectory of politics. Because we cannot change the direction of development without changing the trajectory of politics. So our philosophy, starting from Ubuntu, the basic that we know, we are saying I have nothing to do with Munangaku. I should not talk bad about him. We are, so we're not going to shout or talk ill of Mnangaga. We're not going to talk ill of Chamisa or any other candidate for that matter. Because they are not our focus. There are people like me who one day are going to die like I am going to die. So why focus on an individual? The only thing that I know will not die is this country. So our focus is on the country. So when you don't shout at someone else, they, I don't think they'll shout at you. I will send you our consultation report. That was what we, we found out that violence starts at the mouth. So if you speak ill of someone, don't expect them to, to, to keep quiet. We are not going to speak ill of anyone. We are going to focus purely on what we think we can do in order to change the direction of development of, of this country. So that's the starting point. But we have got the, the basic education. I think they've got the information, not necessarily the knowledge. Most of our educated people. I think I would rather say, yes, the information we do have, but this we can quickly develop into knowledge. Ubuntu can be achieved because I am saying you are because I am. Uripo because Ndiripo. 
development without boundaries. And I'm not talking about physical boundaries. I'm not talking about Binga and Tinkai and so forth. Or Mati North and Mati No. Yes, those are important boundaries. But these are more psychological boundaries as well. So when you develop a nation, start at the psychological side. So that's how we remove then the violence, the bad mouthing. Because psychologically, people must know that they have no reason to fight each other. They have reason to fight for development. It's like when you produce tissues, I produce tissues. We are fighting. I'm producing a better quality than you, and you think you're going. That's the fighting that we are talking about, which is more like competition. So development without boundaries ensures that no district is left behind. No province is left behind. And no mind is left behind. Because people must understand who we are. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a traditional African. Whichever way you want to describe it. I believe until I recognize that uh, I'm no better than you because I come from Chiping and you come from Good. That we mean a lot to each other when we are united. That we are where we are because of our historical background. Because we were colonized. Because a lot of things happened. When you are colonized, your mind is the thing that is affected most. So we need to work on the psychological makeup of our people. So the development without boundaries starts there. And it starts by defining who we are as a nation, our nationhood. Because without defining that, we may never be able to integrate. We may never be able to work together. You can imagine if you go to, if a Ndebele guy comes here, and we are always talking about him and he's aware. Do you think we can produce a good product in effect? No. We must learn to work together first without saying you are Ndebele and, and, and I am this. So that's the starting point. It's national integration. Because when you've got national integration, then you, you can unite. When you unite, you can have peace. When you have peace, you can have social security. Until these are done, you can't move forward. But it all begins from justice. I always insist on this. The starting point is justice. If you feel that you are being maltreated in a given environment, you feel there is no justice. So we cannot even move to, to unit. So justice must prevail first. So the governance systems must be OK. The processes of saying you are guilty, you are not. I can give you a piece of land. I'm not giving this one. I can give you a job. I can give you a contract. Those processes must become transparent. There must be accountability. That's the starting point of justice. When people feel, feel that only one person is getting something from this government or from any government, you, the, the, there is no feeling of justice. So we must look at the traditional African jurisprudence and structures. How did they operate? Because there was fairness. We may not know about it. So I am starting from an African perspective so that people see what is good about being an African and what is good about our past. What is it that we can take from our past so that we can change our present and better our future? That's where we are. That's who would. You, you, you seem to, to be so sure about what you're saying. How do you think, do you, think you have the power or the capacity to mobilize Zimbabwe so that they begin to understand and appreciate what you're doing. It starts from the language that you use. You can change a nation in one evening because of how you portray yourself, the things that say, the honesty that is in you. So it's what leaders say. It, people are not very difficult to change. People can see what's good. Like at this point, I am convinced the Zimbabweans have matured. They know what they want. I know. How do you argue that human beings are illogical? They never do things using logic. Yeah, that's the psychology that we have studied in other books. That I say, let's leave it there for a while and look at our own psychology. I, I think generally human beings are logical. They are only illogical to the extent that uh, I can say if they had a way of surviving without working, 
they would prefer to survive peacefully without working. To that extent, yes. But to the extent of seeing what is good and what is bad for their country, they are not illogical. Otherwise, Mbuyani and the others would not have died fighting for this country. So they are logical. Generally, we are logical. But the problem that happens is that sometimes we get conditioned to a certain way of thinking. People change. But when you condition people, that's when the, the problem is. And conditioning, in my own opinion, can only take place to a limited number of people. Maybe a maximum 30%. Because the 70% cannot be conditioned that easily. The potential for change is always there at, can, at any given point. But it's the language that you use to change them. That's where they say, better the devil I know than the angel I don't know. Especially if your language doesn't make sense. People know what is good or bad. Even those that you think are not educated, they are wise. Even those that you think are in the rural areas, they are very wise. So when you go to them and tell them something that obviously doesn't work, they will not vote for you. I think people are ready to vote for someone whom they see as genuine. We think we can cause change. That's our objective at this stage, to cause change. How, how do you think you can cause change? Uh, I will refer to Makoni. I think you know what he did in 2008. He got 8.5%. The, the idea is not to generally become president of this country. The idea is to be able to, to cause change. Whether in the by, by way of your participation in the private sector or in government. I think we need to force or to convince people that we can cause change so that they give us their vote. They must give us a vote which makes it impossible for anyone to govern without us. And I'm praying to the other nine contestants because people are saying the battle is between ZANPF and CCC. We are saying no. It's a battle of ideas. It can be anyone who comes to, to the front. Don't be surprised if I come up at the top. Don't be surprised if I, come up, if I come at the bottom. It depends on what I say to the people. But I think I've got a message which resonates with what people expect of this country. You entered into this race, engineer. Some believe that it might not actually be a free and fair election. I don't know what people mean. I've always questioned that statement. No election is free and fair because it, you start by paying 20000 So automatically it's not free. You have to pay something. But fair is relative. It depends. I, I believe people are capable of making their own decision in the, ballot, in the ballot box. They might be threatened while outside it. There might be violence outside. But within the ballot box, I think people of this country are mature enough to, 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 to decide on who they want. Do you think the issue of using chips, headmen, to marshal people to vote does not have an effect? Well, if it happens, it has an effect. But to be honest, when I contested in Guru in 2018, no chief marshaled anyone, no headman marshaled anyone. But what I saw was that some people were standing 400 meters away from the polling station. And they were telling people who to vote for. And this is allowed by, by law. If it happens, of course, it's not fair. But they can marshal them. Remember, they say you can take a horse to the river, but you can't force it to drink. So the chiefs can marshal someone. Unless they go with him into the ballot box, they can still vote the way they want. We, we, we learned during that time, that mm. headmaster, mm -hmm. people actually went to school. Mm -hmm were feigning or were forced to declare themselves illiterate so that someone actually was But we had that. You know, you know, Zimbabweans are very good at creating stories. Yes, maybe it happened. But tell me, who actually had the headmaster telling someone to feign ignorance? When people tell me these stories, are you the one who actually had it? They say, I had it from so and so, I had it from so and so, and I had it from so and so. We must avoid it this thing of soiling ourselves as a nation. Yes, maybe it happened. But uh, how do you come to have an opportunity to hear someone being asked to feign ignorance? Uh, when you ask yourself that question, that's when you say, this is probably not true. Because I don't think we are that stupid. In fact, I believe people in the rural areas. Is it stupidity or fear? 
that makes people go to that extent? It's mainly, it's mainly fear. In fact, Macron said we must remove the fear in our people. It's the fear of the unknown. But I believe why people have not voted for the change that some people were advocating for. It's because they didn't see something of value in, in that person who was saying vote for me. When, you know, are, are, you, are you saying people did not see anything of value in Nelson Chamisa in 2018? That's what you must accept. Because you know what, uh, uh, Blessed, if you want to move forward, you must undertake an honest analysis of yourself. If your observation is wrong, your analysis is wrong. If your observation is right and your analysis is wrong, you won't go anywhere. I want to worry about what can make me perform, not what can make ZANPF perform. I am saying if it was possible that people can be threatened to that extent, Manikaland would not have voted overwhelmingly for MDC in 2008. Masingo would not have voted overwhelmingly for MDC in 2008. You get my point? They got 22 out of 26 seats in both Masingo and Manikaland. So, is that not probably the most fairest and freest election that we have seen? In but they also call, called it the most violent. So maybe it's not the fairest. But the runoff, yes, was the most violent. But before the runoff, there was no... I've got my own reasons why people didn't vote. Talk to us about those reasons. Uh, for, 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 for what people... You see, you must have a message when you go to the people. Don't just go and talk about the high prices. Don't just go and talk about the unavailability of fuel and other things. No. They can be available, unavailable even during your time. Tell them how you make sure these things are available. Not to say, Zinuza Dura, Zinuza say No. That's not enough for a wise man to vote for you. Tell the people who were never told what is it, how these things would be changed, how they would get employment, where they would get it from. That's what I think happened. And in the case of 2008, I had the opportunity to talk to Tangrai before he died. And I told him, your biggest mistake in 2008 was to criticize land reform. Because I personally decided not to vote for him because of land reform. I actually decided to register to vote in 1999. Because I said, our land will go away. And I know there are many people that did the same. I don't think I'm the only one. And we actually encourage people to vote for land. You see, sometimes don't you criticize your opponent for the sake of criticizing him. Agree where it is necessary to agree. Because we are fighting for the growth and development of the same country. So where an idea is beneficial to the citizens of this country. Let's agree. Where you actually believe it's not, disagree and offer an alternative solution. But just don't just disagree. To say I don't agree with you. Offer me an alternative solution. And I am saying I am coming to offer an alternative route out of this poverty. I, I will use my personal life as an example. You, you have to start from somewhere. You have to be realistic about where you are going. I don't expect that I'll beat everyone. This is my first time in politics. But I didn't expect to get 40% of the vote in Gruen in 2018. Because I, was, I only campaigned for 40 days. And I was surprised at that, at that number. And I was surprised at the response of the people. So I am saying to myself, the people of Zimbabwe can respond in the same way they did in Gruen in 2018. And, and I can get 40%. Maybe that would be taking too far because I'm not known in certain parts of the country. But I am saying, you work on intuition. Many of your decisions are intuitive. Most, most of your decisions are based on the wisdom. You see someone and you think you love them. And you follow them to their house. And I am saying, they will see my name there. God will tell them what I stand for even if they have not heard about me. The same intuition that led you to your wife, who lead people to the right place to vote for. It may not be all of them. So, because how do I come to, come to this conclusion? In, in, in 2018, 
uh, some of the about 15 of the 23 candidates after getting nominated never went anywhere i'm sure you're aware of this they went home and said no one i didn't see a lot of movement or any movement at all but everyone got got something in binga it might be one vote someone voted them in binga they'd never seen them someone voted them in for them in Mahenye. they'd never seen them that is the faith that i have in the people that is the faith that i have in intuition that is the faith that i have in god's plan for people people will see reality when they see it haven't you met a person and, and you just said before you talk to them i think this is a good person that has happened is it i'm praying that that happens during this election but i'm also saying i'm going to give people a message of hope Let's and i about mm -hmm. the number of candidates that your party has how many does it have uh, for national assembly De deliberately we didn't want to have any candidates uh, i think we've got only one or two and the, the one that i've got is because it comes from where i come from and i said i cannot afford it, uh, not to have a candidate in my constituents back home there but on councillors i think that's where i've got about 40 or so it was very deliberate this was my journey this is the beginning you don't want to spend the resources around the country where you have not been to but what we made sure we did we have got leaders one or two leaders in every ward in every constituency who will be campaigning for the president we think it makes more sense how, how do you expect to lead the country if you are elected and you don't have members of parliament you don't need members of parliament to be president you don't and you should not want to. if i were to be president and i was asked to change a constitution i would actually advocate for a cabinet that is not made up of any member of parliament a president is a president of a country not of a party the moment he, you lead because you've got more members of parliament than the other that's when it becomes unfair the votes becomes based uh, on party politics not on national politics if i am going to lead without a member of, of parliament then i'll be talking fairly and genuinely to each member of parliament about exactly what I think is necessary for this country. But once it becomes partisan, then the country will continue to go into, into the forest. I, think, I don't think it's much better. If a president... How, how do you get your policies uh, moved if you do not control parliament? Because parliament becomes the springboard of power and influence, doesn't it? If you consider that people are generally unreasonable, if you consider that politicians are unreasonable. But I'll tell you something about politicians. They may be unreasonable at the time of election, but when they see a good policy, they know it. Zimbabweans are not that stupid, even those members of parliament. They will support a good policy. And I have every faith in every individual in this country. When the, when the time is right and the policy is right, everyone will support it. It's about the policy. It's about the language. It's about what you intend to do for your country. So for me, it's not a, a, a problem that I may not have an MP. I actually prefer to people to work with people who may be alien to me at that point. Because if I can convince them coming from the outside, it means I've got a better chance of making this country work than to whip people around, you know, as the chief whip. And so, no, we don't want whips. In, in, in this country. We want ideas. People can listen to my... I have not heard many people who have listened to me and said my ideas don't make sense. They just worry about the funding. Where will the country get this? And so forth. And that should be our challenge. People don't need to be whipped. All those, if I become president today, everyone in parliament they will be sitting with me at the same table and planning this country because we need to plan it together. It's not about the name of your family or the name of your party or the name of this. No. Once we continue to do that, we continue down God going down this gully. I, I also want to appreciate how big you want your cabinet to be. Uh, or how small? Uh, when, when you look at, I've got what I call the frameworks of governance there. So, so, I think... Uh, 
you cannot make it any less than 16. Because we are a developing country. But it's not the size of cabinet. It's also the size of the ministry. You see, you can have a cabinet and your ministry is just 20 people. All of it. Because it's like a planning department. Like what Huawe headed, the planning commission during the time of Mugabe. That was a ministry. It was never called a ministry. But we had a planning commission headed by Huawe. You remember? So, don't look at the number of ministries because that's the number of jobs that must be done. They have to be done unless, unless you give 20 jobs to one person. We can even have 20, but very small. Each one smaller than what a normal ministry uh, has been over the past 40 years. So don't worry about the number. What about the number of people in the ministry? I'm just looking at 60 ministers Mm. Drawing from the fiscus, all driving SUV vehicles. That obviously will change. I, I don't know why anyone needs the three cars from government. What are, what are they for? I don't know why a permanent secretary would need three cars from government. What are they for? Those are things that must change. Because the people are needed to do work. If you are going to be in your car for most of the time or in three cars most of your time, how do you find time to work in your office? So maybe they just need one car. Maybe we need to give them loans to buy a second car for themselves and their families. Government cannot bear the brand of giving three, four cars to one man in government. I don't think it makes sense. It's not the number of people. It's the resources that you attach to them as a nation. That's what must change. I, I saw someone being appointed the permanent secretary and the, automatically there were two, three cars around him. Yeah? And a new one bought immediately. How do we afford to do that? That's what must change. It's the implementation of these things. And if people wa want to work, they should not need so many cars. We don't live in cars. We should be in offices most of the time. I want to thank you very much for joining me on this stuff. We talk in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation. Now, this is presidential candidate um, for the NPC and looking to change things. Engineer Wilbert Ashbold Mahiwa. Now, engineer, I'll give you an opportunity to look into the people of Zimbabwe and tell them from your heart a message from your heart at this point on something maybe that we didn't touch on or something that you strongly think that you need to share with the people before we call it a day. Thank you, Blessed. I want to believe people listening at the moment want to know what is it that I stand for. I stand for development and service delivery without boundaries. I call for development throughout the country so that there is an equal distribution of opportunities. I call for the creation of opportunities for everyone, so that anyone who wants to go into business, anyone who wants to do anything, can choose what it is that they want. I call for a process of entrepreneurship where people are not categorized into youth, women, or men. I want to call for a system where any individual chooses what it is that they like to do most and the government must assist them. There is no country in the world whose entrepreneurs grow big without the input of government, without the help of government. We are all entrepreneurs and I want to promise you that entrepreneurship is going to be at the heart of what we want to do in order to achieve a total industrialization of this country. We want to improve our manufacturing. We want to improve particular sport. I am convinced that sport as a starting point can be used to grow our industries. The defense and national security sector is very critical for me in terms of how it can induce production within the industry because we produce for the consumption of the people. So generally what I'm saying to you as people of Zimbabwe is 
Don't look at my, at, my, at, at my history as a politician. Look at my history and my capacity as an individual. I am running for president. And I know, with or without MPs in government, I am going to bring change to this country. Let's repeat what Makoni did. Let's get someone outside the two major players, as they are said today, who gets more than 20% to make sure that no one can run the, this country without, without others. Let's go back to the days of 2008, 2009. Let's get to the earlier days of the 1990s and 1980s, where production is everywhere. If you are in Gutu, if you are in Kariba, I want you to get ready to be in business. We can all be business people, 10 million of us, as long as we produce something that can be consumed by our neighbors, our neighboring countries, and so forth. Let's be a country of producers. Let's be a country of business people. I want to expand the horizons and the opportunities that are available to our people to become entrepreneurs, to become masters of their own destiny. I want to the country to become a master of its own destiny, to become a reliable partner in SADC, to become a reliable partner in the world. Our time is now. Your time is now. It is our time. Let's change this country. Let's forget our political differences. Come to the one man who will unite everyone in this country, regardless of political affiliation. Come to engineer we will be at Ajbol Dumbaiwa. I have come to rescue everyone. I have come to make sure that there are opportunities everywhere for everyone. As long as you are willing to work, there should be an opportunity for you in the government led by Engineer Mbaiwa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Mbaiwa. Now I'm just going to read a part of, of, from your manifesto uh, in, as we close. So this is part of the manifesto of the NPC led by engineer Wilbert Mbaiwa and it says our ideology is Ubuntu, primary, preliminary expanded in our manifesto escapulates to development without boundaries. This is development which leaves no one behind. We stand for development, progress, and prosperity, which leaves no dynasty, group, race, region, and religion behind. We believe that this is the only way we can achieve justice. National integration, unity, peace, and social security. This is what the NPC party stands for. Now this is the race to presidency in 2023, August 23, where you are called upon to play your role as a citizen to cast your ballot for the future of your country. The decision is yours. We encourage citizens to do so in a peaceful environment make a clear and conscious decision. But as we always say, we are the alternative voice. We are the voice that allows everyone to be heard. We are the platform that brings Zimbabwean citizens talking to each other and not through each other. We are the free talk. We are proud, proudly in partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation for freedom. And this, the free talk, the Heart and Soul TV and radio with me, your host as usual, Dara B. Until next time, thank you for joining us and don't forget to subscribe on our YouTube channel to support the work that we do. Thank you, Engineer. I, I see you've got a presidential height. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it reminds you of Mugabe. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this room, yeah. we have pictures of legends of yeah. the heroes of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, your, your Josiah Tongo Garas, your Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Robert Gabriel Mugabe. That's Takawira there, yeah. Leopold. Yes. 
maybe share with us why do you have all this? You know, every country has its heroes. And whether we like it or not, these are our heroes. They went out and stood for something that they believed in. They sacrificed their lives. Their work was completed in 1980, although they continued to work. I am saying we must take off from where they left. We must go into our conscience and ask ourselves, what is it that they could, wanted to achieve if they have not been taken away from us? And we continue from there. And, and then we create our own aspirations, which our children and grandchildren will also carry on and, and fulfill. But we want to fulfill the unfinished work. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the free talk. This is the free talk on HSTV, in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation. Thank you. Thank you.